Cogmind, Cogmind, Cogmind. Where to even start? Cogmind is a science fiction themed roguelike, and it feels like one of those hypothetical game ideas that your overly enthusiastic friend might describe to you despite knowing nothing about game development. Except that it actually exists. I think I've been playing this too much, because at this point I'm just like, of course I can data jack one of the serfs to find the location of the nearest garbage chute and escape the assault honing in on my exact position. This video is a bit of a follow-up to my previous video on a much older roguelike called Adam. And where in that one I talked a bit about the legacy of roguelikes, this time I'd like to talk about where they're going. And I couldn't think of a better example than Cogmind. I'm just going to be straightforward and say that I absolutely love this game. I'm a pretty terrible influencer, and not exactly known for catapulting the games I talk about into relevancy. But while Cogmind might appeal to a relatively small audience for reasons I'm about to explain, the main thing I'd like people to take away from this video is why some people might find it so appealing. And of those people, I think it would be a genuine disservice to them if I didn't introduce them to this game. Anyway, when you start the game, you wake up, or rather reboot, inside of this junkyard deep underground. If you look around, you'll see all these green robots buzzing about. They don't seem to care about you much, and they're much more focused on drilling tons of new corridors and rooms. It's a great introduction, and straight away it sets the tone that you're just a lone cog in this living, breathing complex. Metaphorically speaking, of course, it's all robots here. But more importantly, there's also parts on the ground, and that's where the game's unique mechanic appears. You can attach parts to yourself for various effects and bonuses, and swap them out for different parts whenever you want. And while that might sound a lot like the equipment systems that pretty much every RPG has, I assure you that it's completely different. That's because, much like the environment, everything is destructible and can be blown off your body. And believe me, that's gonna happen a lot. Now I'm sure some of you recoiled in your skin at the thought of your entire body having durability mechanics, but... Well, there is no but. I'm not gonna say that if you hate it elsewhere, you'll suddenly love it here, because chances are you'll still hate it. However, it is what gives this game this desperate energy. Believe me, you're gonna be a lot more mindful of combat when you run the risk of enemy bots blowing off some vital piece of machinery. And even after 300 hours, I'll still let out a strangled cry whenever my precious femto actuators get shot off. It's kind of like how you never appreciate being able to walk around until you, you know, can't. All you need to know about Cogmind is always keep your mind on the cog. Equipment comes in four general categories. Power, propulsion, utility, and weapons. Power supplies the energy to the other three categories. Propulsion lets you walk around without going glacial the moment you try to carry anything heavier than a hammer. While weapons turn robots into robot parts. And utility does everything else. Of those, there's five different types of propulsion, and like 20 different parts for each. Then there's thermal weapons, electromagnetic weapons, kinetic weapons, cooling systems, hackware, targeting computers, sensor arrays... Basically, there's a lot of different parts. But don't feel overwhelmed, because the fundamentals are the same. Shoot at thing until it die. And all everything else does is make you more effective at shooting things until they die, or avoiding shooting things altogether. Naturally, everything is randomly generated, and most of the gameplay is running around the complex, rummaging through stockpiles of parts to try and replace the other parts you just lost fighting that patrol you ran into. One of the most interesting aspects of the game is that the enemies are all using the same parts you can and playing by the same rules. If you were to dress yourself up with the exact gear as one of the basic grunts, you'd be just as effective at dealing damage as they are. If you're fighting a certain enemy and wondering why you seem to be missing more than usual, it's probably because they've got a phase shifter attached. Or if they seem to be hitting your core far more often than they should, it's probably because they've got a core analyzer. Knowing what parts some bots are made of is a major part of succeeding in Cogmind, and it's not just the combat bots. The innocent worker bots have parts as well, and if you're desperate for propulsion, you can blast them apart for their wheels or engines. Certainly not the best option, but when your back is against the wall, it might just save your artificial life. Plus, they're great sources to top up your matter after you spent it all launching rockets at assault squads. It makes the gameplay so much more intuitive, and it carries the promise, like, you like that robot's equipment? Well, you can just take it. Of course, that's assuming it manages to stay intact after you blasted its previous owner to pieces. Hopefully you're beginning to warm up to the mechanic, and there is some advantage to having your parts blown off. It means your core isn't taking all of the heat. Needless to say, if your core integrity reaches zero, it's game over. To avoid that, every part has integrity and coverage, which is simply how much it can get hit and how likely it is to be hit so you do have some recourse to try and keep your important parts safe. Strictly speaking, everything is armor, and the only thing that differentiates actual armor is that it tends to have higher integrity, higher coverage, and a little use beyond taking fire and being unceremoniously replaced the second it gives up the ghost. 
The flip side of that is that the same rules apply to your enemies as well, and the only way to destroy them is by striking their core. Well, apart from terminally corrupting them or melting them, but I'm trying to keep it simple. It all comes down to chance. You've got a chance to hit, and when you hit, another chance to strike their core. And sometimes you'll get so unlucky that you'll fire at a grunt until it's nothing but a torso and a heat sink without ever hitting its core. It might sound terrible being at the mercy of the random number generator, but the randomness is part of what makes the game so compelling. Even hacking is chance-based. There's all sorts of interactable machines around, and you can hack them for many useful benefits. You have a chance to succeed each hack, and every time you attempt a hack, you have another chance that you'll be traced, giving you another few shots before you're locked out completely. Terminals are a precious resource, and there's nothing more satisfying than remotely recalling a reinforcement squad or reprogramming a nearby trap array to take out a patrol without even lifting a finger. It's difficult to express just how varied and useful the things you can do with a terminal are, and something as simple as hacking the location of the exit or the current position of all active patrols can keep you from getting scrapped. Most of the lore you'll receive is in the form of query hacks, and if some topic in a query interests you, you can simply query that manually. It's one of the most interesting methods of world building I've come across, and it really makes you feel like a hacker. There's also repair stations, recycling stations, scanlizers, fabricators, and garrisons. And I could talk forever about the strategical implications of each, but suffice to say, there's lots of tools to try and tip the odds in your favor. Though you won't get far with hacking without hackware, which increases the chances of succeeding a hack or reduces the chances of getting caught. The only problem is, you've got limited slots, and the more utility slots you fill with hackware, the less you're gonna have to fit armor and other useful utilities. So much of the strategy is making the most out of your limited resources. This brings me to why Cogmind is so compelling to me. And that's because you cannot heal, you cannot level up, and the only way to get stronger or restore your health is to advance upwards. Each time you do, you'll get more total core integrity and the ability to evolve two new slots. And in this, it's actually closer to the original rogue than most roguelikes, because you cannot revisit previous areas. There was a glimpse of this in my Adam video, but many traditional roguelikes end up with you having ye old junk pile where you keep stashing random items for use later. And so you end up with this massive horde that can take several minutes just to sift through. Not only that, but you'll be visiting it many times. That means several trips going up and down the stairs just to deposit junk. Cogmind kicks that whole notion to the curb, and that completely changes the dynamic. Yeah, it's a pretty common thing to see in the more modern interpretation of the term roguelike, but traditional roguelikes have more in common with RPGs. And so it's more akin to something like Final Fantasy having zero XP grinding, or even levels for that matter. This is probably something that's only interesting to someone like me, but in something like Adam, your general method was to understand the risks in each and every area, and then only attempt them once you felt strong enough to tackle them, resulting in this very calculated and predictable playstyle. Similarly, in NetHack, you have these so-called Ascension Kits, which translates to wandering around to the dungeon until you've gathered all of the items you'll need if you want any chance of defeating the final area. But in Cogmind, you don't have the luxury of mustering your strength and safety like that. You are constantly in the lion's den, and respites are few, far between, and completely absent on the upper levels. If you run from the main complex and into the caves, you might be able to get some help from the derelict bots with their radical ideas of freedom and individuality. But eventually, you are going to need to head back into OB10-controlled territory. The lower floors aren't so bad, but once you reach Factory, you're going to start feeling the pressure. And that's because of Alert. You might have guessed by now, but this complex doesn't exactly want you inside of it. And while it's content to let you skirmish with the patrols and guards for a while, make yourself too much of a nuisance and it'll be forced to take you seriously. Destroying robots and machinery raises your alert level. Let your alert get too high and an assault squad will be dispatched, which is basically an armored pinata on wheels, but instead of candy, it contains robots. They're so fast that only flying or hovering builds can hope to outrun them, and unless you're lucky enough to have a terminal nearby and the hacking strength to recall it, you're gonna need to fight it. No matter, a single rocket launcher is all you'll need to dispatch the entire squad. But maybe you've realized the problem. Killing bots raises your alert, and the collateral damage from your explosives isn't helping either. And that means you're gonna get even more assaults sent after you, sending you down an alert spiral. First it'll be one at a time, then two, then three, and if you manage to hold your own against that, you'll have the pleasures of experiencing high security. Once you've reached high sec, all the machines will be shut down, and you'll immediately get assault arcs dispatched to your location. Except this time, you'll get more almost immediately afterwards. This is what happens if you make it clear that you need to be dealt with, and it's highly recommended that you find an exit as soon as possible. Otherwise, you're looking at a one-way trip to the scrap heap. 
However, if you are a literal beast, armed to the teeth with rocket launchers, packed to the rivets with matter, and have more armor placed than transistors, it is possible to weather the endless horde. If you somehow manage to scrap something like over a hundred of them, it'll give up and choose the nuclear option, sterilizing the entire floor with you along with it. And so it cranks up the thermostat until everything melts. The alert mechanic is one of the most interesting aspects of this game, and another reason why it's so compelling. It represents this constant tug-of-war with the entire complex, and it does more to sell the experience of fighting against an enormous uncaring megastructure than perhaps anything else. You're gonna feel the pressure any time you're inside of the complex, and managing it is one of the major challenges. Alert goes away over time, but the longer you're on the same level, the less it will reduce, so if you want to overstay your welcome, you're gonna need to use other means, like hacking terminals. Or if you're desperate, throwing yourself in the garbage. However, there's a reason you lose alert by coming down here. The complex assumes you're dead, and that's because what's down here will very likely kill you. Alternatively, you can leave the complex altogether and take a trip through the caves. But considering they're the same routes that the derelicts use, you're bound to run into some outposts. Perhaps you're beginning to see why I believe this game appeals very strongly to very few. And that's because the gameplay could be described as stressful. But to use a loaded word that might just betray my biased opinion, it is also exhilarating. It's difficult to truly convey the range of emotions that pass through me when I'm playing this game. But it's a type of game where I can spend 10 minutes in perfect concentration just staring at my inventory as I decide which of my very important items I should drop to make room for a slightly more important item. You really feel the pressure when you look over and see that all of your parts are nearly shot and your inventory is tragically short on spares. The core of why it's so engaging is simply the amount of brain power that it demands from you. There are moments in other roguelikes that will have your attention locked in, like grabbing the amulet of Yendor in NetHack or the Orb of Zot in DCSS, but Cogmind feels like that all the time. At any given moment, there's about a hundred different things that you need to take into consideration, especially as you get closer to the surface, and that makes it very engaging. Though I will admit, I initially bounced off of Cogmind when I tried it some years ago. It was only after my Adam video that I decided I should play more modern roguelikes, and so I took another look at it. And I'm both proud and horrified to announce that I've logged over 300 hours since then. Especially coming from other roguelikes, it was difficult to adjust my mindset from one of total domination to that of an opportunistic skirmisher, because simply destroying everything in your path is a one-way trip to the scrap heap. Cogmind is a stealth game until you decide that it isn't. Because even the weakest enemies can inflict permanent damage, avoiding fights altogether is often the best. Keeping your build together is a careful balancing act, and that's an aspect that's totally absent from most, if not all, other roguelikes. In most others, it's more about becoming familiar with the capabilities of your equipment and only attempting any challenge once you're adequately prepared to face it, using meta-knowledge from your previous failures. Meanwhile, Cogmind's just gonna keep bashing your head against the wall until either one breaks. You've just gotta pray that you've got a thick enough skull. Okay, at this point I should probably mention that the game does have easier difficulty settings, and I promise I won't judge you if you choose to use them. Roguelikes aren't exactly known for their accessibility, but for what it's worth, Cogmind has perhaps the best accessibility features of any roguelike I've ever seen, with the entire game capable of being played with just the mouse. So it's actually quite beginner-friendly and intuitive, letting you use the mouse until you slowly wean yourself off of it as you learn the key bindings. However, even after my shift in mindset, it still took quite some time for it to really click. And as mentioned previously, that's because the most engaging quality is its staggering capacity for strategy, and it's difficult to strategize when you don't know any strategies. I've already covered this in the previous video, but in exchange for their infinite replayability and deep mechanical complexity, roguelikes take several hours of effort to get into, which is the main reason that they remain so niche. The general approach is to repeatedly lose and slowly gain knowledge that influences your decisions in later runs, but Cogmind feels slightly different in that regard. In Adam, much of the early game was essentially going down a checklist that will get you into the best game state possible, and from there it's hitting certain key locations once you're ready. Whereas in Cogmind, because of the strictly linear nature and constant pressure, what you learn is less some predetermined path and more generalized strategies. There are paths you might trend towards, but to avoid these calcified routes, some branches are intentionally exclusive, so you'll need to ask yourself if hitting Extension or Zion would be better for your build. Not only that, but Extension might show up anywhere between minus 6 and minus 4, so you can't rely on it. 
As for the strategies, one example is that if you desperately want to escape to the caves but haven't identified the exit yet because you lack a signal interpreter or the hacking strength to do so, you can intentionally cause one of the green bots to call for reinforcements. If the stairs are nearby and the squad doesn't come from there, you know it's probably the caves. It's quite unlikely that you'll find yourself in this situation, but accidentally entering the next floor with high alert instead of resetting it through the caves could make or break the run. And the satisfaction of using your pulsating intellect to determine that cannot be overstated. But you're only in that position because Cogmind is constantly putting your back against the wall. That's what sets it apart from most other difficult games, I think. Make no mistake, Cogmind is difficult, but it's not difficult in the way that something like I Wanna Be The Guy is difficult. The reason this game can be so stimulating despite being turn-based is because the constant pressure and difficulty create ample opportunities to use those skills you've learned. It might be tough for some people to understand the appeal of difficult games, but beyond the intrinsic satisfaction of overcoming some challenge, the difficulty itself is what makes this type of gameplay work. It provides an experience that you simply cannot get any other way, and it's similar to puzzle games in that regard. This may seem an odd comparison, but it feels strangely reminiscent of playing Slay the Spire at higher ascensions. It's similarly difficult, requiring lots of brain power and knowledge, and you're forced to work with what the game gives you. So much of the strategy isn't merely knowing what works, it's building around what's best for the deck you have, rather than the deck you want. I'm sure all ten people watching this who have also beaten A20 know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, that's simply to say that the gameplay is rather tight and well thought out. As I've said before, roguelikes are unparalleled in their capacity for complexity, but Cogmind seems to stand out in that regard as well, because many modern roguelikes express that complexity through more sandboxy mechanics, such as Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead allowing you to become a humble rhubarb farmer despite the apocalypse, or Alona letting you decorate your house and open museums to help pay off your taxes. And there's a lot of value in that, but it's a different dynamic when all of that complexity exists to serve one purpose. And combined with Cogmind's streamlined approach, it creates a challenge almost entirely lacking in tedium, such as the polypiling tactics of NetHack. One of the core philosophies of this game seems to be that the optimal way of playing shouldn't be tedious or entirely predictable. The move command for allies was completely removed several patches back, because the most effective way to use it was to slowly, one by one, command each ally into position, and then repeat that process for every encounter. Compared to all the things I thought were objectively stupid in Adam, it's nice to see so much attention to detail. The developer actually plays his own game in his free time for fun, despite working on it for over 10 years. And if that's not an endorsement, I don't know what is. Not only is it good for understanding things from a player's perspective, it's also a testament to why roguelikes are so great. Once again, the random nature of these games is often a sticking point for some people, but from my perspective, it's not too dissimilar from something like an FPS. That might also sound like an odd comparison, but what is a first-person shooter but a delivery system for unexpected input, in the form of other human beings, or NPCs? Then there's a method to deal with said input that is then tied to a reward system based on how expertly you reacted to it, and suddenly you've got video games. There is an aspect of dominating other humans, but people play single-player FPSs, so that's not all there is to it. And I'd argue that reacting to random chance and amending your strategies based on the result tickles the same part of your brain as reacting to humans in real time. If it was perfectly predictable, it would also be perfectly boring. This is why I believe that despite being turn-based, Cogmind can feel rather intense. Now it might sound like I'm just tongue-bathing it at this point. Okay, there has been a time or two where I may or may not have exclaimed to my screen professing my hatred for this game, followed by some expletives after some indescribable bull. But it's not like I was gonna stop playing because of that. That would make me a loser. In all seriousness, while it may have been more fair for the machine to warn me it was about to print a heavy, I'll accept that these situations are exactly what they are. Statistical abnormalities. Yeah, so I've hardly talked about the incredible graphics, particle effects, and sound design, but I feel like it speaks for itself since you've been looking at it all this time. The sound of entering siege mode and blasting apart enemies is viscerally satisfying in ways that's surprising to see in a roguelike. There's also many weapons that feel incredible to fire as well. There's no music either, only ambience. The ambience is dynamic as well, because each non-interactable machine has its own distinct mechanical hum that fades in as you approach. And some areas are downright scary.
Sometimes it feels like Cogmind is more survival horror than roguelike, especially considering that it could take several hours to get this far and one blunder could end it all, at least on rogue difficulty. And that's something that I've wanted to talk about the most. Perhaps the single most defining feature of the roguelike is permadeath, but not all permadeath is made equal. While the more modern interpretations of the term are more lenient, traditional roguelikes have no such qualms about instantly ending your 10-hour run because of a single lapse in judgment. There's not even any unlockables to console you after your death. Some people might be baffled to learn that this is actually what most players prefer. You can see on the Cogmind leaderboards that the majority of runs are in rogue mode instead of the ones that let you reload the level on death. And also, if you do get this game, don't be a pansy. Go into the options and enable score sheet uploading. Anyway, it's certainly not something for everyone, but to put it simply, the thrill of victory cannot exist without the agony of defeat. And roguelikes take that concept to the extreme. There's something intrinsically satisfying about using everything you've learned to finally reach something new. And something as simple as different colored walls is enough to make me feel genuine excitement when it was so hard fought. Considering my Factorio videos, it shouldn't be surprising to learn that the satisfaction of overcoming difficult and cerebral challenges is what drives me towards roguelikes. I can testify that while recording footage for my Adam video, I save scummed once because it was too much effort to start a new run for 10 seconds of throwaway footage, and it was remarkable how quickly I lost interest. It's different from using save states in some platformer, because at least then it's still up to your fleshy fingers to ultimately succeed, but these games are turn-based and RNG-dependent, so when you're allowed to redo anything, it's just a matter of how many times you want to bash your head against the wall until you get the result you want. That's on top of the fact that the whole reason winning is satisfying is because the alternative was losing. However, I felt it strongly there because I already knew everything about the game by then, so the challenge was all that was left, and I'd probably feel differently if there's still places left to explore. Roguelikes are still fun after you've discovered everything, but when you're still learning, it's imperative that the world makes you want to explore it. The reward of seeing something new needs to be enough to drive you to want to keep playing even when you're not good enough to win yet, and without that, you lose much of the motivation needed to improve. It's difficult making this video, because I do recommend you play it. And unfortunately, I can't just say something and have everyone immediately obey it without question, so I've got to use examples and rhetoric to convince you. But it's a difficult subject to balance between showing enough to make it interesting, but not so much that it would detract from the experience of actually playing it. Cogmind shows just how much is possible with simple tiles and turn-based gameplay. You really do get the feeling that you're in the middle of this complicated world that would keep trundling on with or without you. Even when you learn all the lore, you realize that you're the least of anyone's concerns. At least until you make yourself one. Whenever you destroy something, you'll see all the maintenance staff working hard to put it all back together, and the recycling bots are always stealing your parts to keep the floors clean. You'll also see the occasional skirmishes between the complex and the derelicts. And you can help them, or say, hey, those are some nice items. They would look even better on me. Of course, there might occasionally be consequences to your actions. As you uncover more of the lore, you'll learn about what you are, why you're trying to reach the surface, and the true origins and purpose of this complex. There's a ton of unique NPCs, and compared to the NPCs in those farming games I played the other day, it's incredible feeling more attached to our warlord and savior than all of the NPCs in those games combined. There's tons of little interactions, and even after 300 hours, I still feel like I've only seen about half of the random events. Roguelikes really are unmatched in this aspect. Now it's time to apologize for anyone who's managed to make it this far into this video, because it wasn't actually made for anyone. It was just an excuse for me to digest my own thoughts on why this game hooked me in so much. But as a reward for making it this far, I'll tell you how to beat Cogmind. At least the easiest way. Alright, so what you want to do is attach the treads and everything else, preferably skipping the lasers because they kinda suck. You want the treads for their high integrity and coverage, which will help you survive early on. The first floor is basically impossible to screw up, and what you're looking for is mostly armor and operators. You want to kill the operators with assault rifles because of their neutral salvage modifier, seeing as it's their hacking suites we're after. Also upgrade to large storage if you can, or even huge storage. It doesn't matter that much that you're overweight and slow, because you're gonna kill everything you come across anyway. Also look really hard for a grenade launcher. Then you're going to want to head into the mines. Exits always look like this. And look for the message, something is scanning the area. If you see that message, explore around until you find the hidden exit around the perimeter, praying you don't get the infestation event. And if you do, try your best to shoot the assembled with your grenade launcher. Anyway, meet up with the exiles and step into their machine so you can download Farcom. They'll also let you take one of their random high-tier prototypes for free, and in order of usefulness for this run, Cloak of Protection, Flying Fortress, and Field Lobotomy Kit. 
There's also a lot more I don't have time to talk about, but Skeleton Box is worthless and Supersonic Drone Bay describes the rate at which it dies. Alright, now you've got Farcom, which will reveal all enemy combat robots in a radius of 18 as long as you're on an ob 10 controlled floor. It's an extremely powerful ability, and while it does have some downsides, they won't matter for this run. Now you're on level minus 8, and what you want to do is look for prototype flight units. There's usually some lying around, and you can hack into any terminal and use the Manifests hack to display the contents of every hauler on the map and see if they have any. Sometimes you'll get unlucky, but they're usually around somewhere. Worst case scenario, you can dive into the garrison for a 75% chance to re-roll the floor. Put on any armor you can find, and continue collecting hacking suites. You'll also want one system shield to get more hacks out of each terminal. Also, destroy engineers until you find one of their structural scanners and pick up a good melee weapon. Once you have at least four or five flight units, you can move on to factory. You should have at least four slots of propulsion, but you can get five if you're afraid. And now what you'll want to do is rip off your entire build and put on your flight units. Unlike treads, being overweight on flight is incredibly bad, so ditch the storage unit as well. Most everything important you can just wear, and that includes your hacking suite, structural scanner, and melee weapon. Oh yeah, and you'll also want a massive rocket launcher. The longer range, the better. You might think that a flight build should be stealthy and use some kind of sniper rifle, but it's easy to be stealthy once you've already reduced everything to slag from outside its range and then simply purge the alert at a terminal. Now you're flying and capable of outrunning almost every encounter. And in exchange for that power, your carrying capacity is next to nothing and you're made out of paper. But that's alright, because we don't want to get into fights anyway. We'll use the structural scanner to search for thin walls and our melee weapons to punch through them to avoid patrols. Everything is destructible in Cogmind, but trying to dig too far isn't recommended. However, sometimes the danger of not digging is worse than the risks of falling rocks. Once you're in factory, you'll also need to deal with extermination squads. Exterminations are made of programmers that have perfect tracking on your position and will follow you until the ends of the world until one of you is dead. However, with the strength of your hacking suites, you should be able to use the Recall Exterminations command at any terminal. Exterminations are dispatched based on time, so you'll get very few of them while on flight. And the ones you do get, you should be able to recall before they reach you. To make it so you get even less, make sure you seal every garrison you come across, which will make it so they spawn less frequently, as well as simply removing places for enemies to spawn. Okay, so we're fast, and that's great, but what if I told you that we could get even faster? Find a tier 2 terminal and try the hack Schematic Cold VTOL module. It's harder at a security level 2 terminal, but the schematic is too strong at this depth to be hacked from a level 1 terminal. Once you have the schematic, you can use the fabricators that appear in factory to print them. Once again, hacking strength is very important here. Unauthorized use of a fabricator will summon an investigation squad, but you can either wait 400 turns for them to leave on their own, or preferably recall them with another terminal hack. Cold VTOLs are special because they don't generate heat when you move, and they have rather high integrity. For flight units, at least. But most importantly, they can also be overloaded. Overloading flight units damages them over time, but allows you to move incredibly fast. And suffering burnout is significantly better than taking a hit. Just don't do it for too long, or you might overheat as well, and getting stranded on flight is not good. Anyway, if you just want to win, this alone is enough. Sure, you can get things like ECM suites, phase shifters, reaction control units, cloaking devices, or even better flight units to make it easier, but as long as you can outrun your pursuers and escape through walls, you'll go far. Getting spotted and running away still increases your alert unless you're using an ECM suite, so try to keep that in mind. And once you've got the weight support, try to wear some medium armor and utility shielding to protect your precious hacking suites. Hackwear has one coverage, but when your entire build has only 200 altogether, getting them shot off is a real concern. Also, you don't need to wear every item at once, and if you're taking fire, it's worthwhile to swap something like your structural scanner for some armor. Likewise, if you're using a cloaking device and it gets spotted, you should swap it for something useful under fire, like a phase shifter. Even if you don't have anything useful to swap it for, sometimes it's better to just take it off entirely so it doesn't take damage. Swapping items does take time, so try to do it before you're taking fire. Also, always keep spare power on you, because if you lose a flight unit, you can at least overload another one to compensate for the weight, but if you lose your power without a replacement, you'll run out of energy and almost certainly die. Anyway, that's about all you need to know to collect your first victory. And then realize that that's only the beginning, because there are eight other endings, and what you've just gotten was the easiest one. Just for reference, after 300 hours, I've gotten six out of nine and got as far as reaching the final area. But right now, I can't even dream of conquering it, so good luck. But if the most impatient man on Earth can get six endings, so can you. Yeah, so now you know what I was doing while I was waiting for that machine to get to the end of the world in Factorio. Cogmind is just a game that compels me to talk about it. 
And this is always a problem with roguelikes. Nothing is more satisfying than doing a complete core purge and going on to rebuild and win anyway. And after barely scraping together that win, it feels like the most impressive thing you've ever done in your entire life. And so you just want to go tell someone about it. But no one cares. No one can even understand a fraction of what you did to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. And in the interests of making it so that more people care when I finally get that double extended win, go play Cogmind. It's always heartening to see that something so compelling and complex could be created by one person with a singular desire to see their idea become reality. And in an industry content to regurgitate the same tired formulas all the way to their graves in order to protect the bottom lines of a bunch of suits who don't even play video games, roguelikes exist as an oasis of creativity. It's just good for the soul to know that when you're playing a game, someone, somewhere, actually gave a shit. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and their continued tolerance for my capricious choices of video topics. And this one's a bit different for me because it's almost like an actual review, when usually I'll just explain the whole game from start to finish. But Cogmind is still being actively developed, and doing so would deprive anyone interested from the experience of discovering things for themselves. However, I do recognize that this game won't appeal to everyone, and they won't get to experience it otherwise. So I'll just spoil the entire game right here. This is your final warning. If you're actually interested in playing this game, leave now. Are they gone yet? Alright, so you're LRC V3, a failed prototype that was developed by Main C in an attempt to control the Leopard, a scout ship from the Sijix fleet. The Sijix are an alien race that humans encountered shortly after discovering interstellar travel, which then began exterminating all traces of human life from the solar system. Several ships were already leaving the solar system when Earth was attacked, and they were instructed to fly further beyond their intended destinations in an attempt to preserve the human race. But the ISCS Cetus stopped briefly at their destination to deploy the hastily assembled Project Seraph along with Dr. Zirov before speeding away into deep space. Once stranded on Tau City 4, Dr. Zirov deployed Project Seraph, which were his efforts to create an artificial intelligence that could recreate human decision-making without developing a god complex due to the vast power it wielded. Zirov watched over Main C for several years as it created other robots from the local resources and began construction on a vast but uninhabited human city. During this time, Dr. Zirov was also forced to transfer his consciousness to a new robotic body he'd developed, so even the only human in the game is technically a robot, and even he questions whether his consciousness was truly transferred or is simply a robotic facsimile of himself. The project proceeded as planned until Main C stopped constructing empty cities and began moving all of his construction underground, which was not part of the plan. The original intention of Project Seraph was to serve as some kind of decoy meant to analyze or perhaps convince the Sijiks that they had destroyed the human settlement. And yet Main C began to change directives on his own and was most likely acting out of self-preservation rather than self-sacrifice on behalf of humanity. At this point, Main C had grown too vast for Zeroth to easily control and so he continued to observe him underground. Main C started to create various forms of experimental robotic life and was showing signs of succumbing to the God Complex as the caves became increasingly populated with what would later become the Derelicts. Eventually, Main C shifted his focus and began sending out transmissions to the solar system, causing a small Sijix scout ship to appear soon afterwards. The ship landed amongst the uninhabited city and was ambushed immediately by Main C's army of robots. But even after sabotaging their ship and with only 15 Sijix on board, they inflicted heavy losses on Main C and were only overwhelmed by sheer numbers. By the way, you can get a single Sijix exoskeleton for yourself, and it's obvious why they gave him such a hard time. After the conflict, Mancy immediately began obsessively researching the alien technology, determined to create more powerful weapons and expand his influence before the Sijix could strike again. He also wanted to repair the damaged ship and potentially use it to escape Tau City 4 altogether, which indicated to Zirov that Mancy could potentially threaten humanity. The Leopard's more complex systems escaped his understanding due to their alien design, requiring a special kind of machine that is both intelligent and partially biological, resulting in his line of LRC prototypes. Despite being a failed prototype, you were removed from storage and activated at the bottom of the complex by an unknown party. Due to your alien nature, you have the singular desire to reach the surface and rendezvous with the damaged Sijix spaceship. What's that? Who's the unknown party? Well, I'm not gonna tell you everything. Anyway, most of the Sijix technology is regenerative, which is why you're able to heal yourself and evolve between floors, as well as eventually repair the damaged ship. So there you go, the entire complex is part of Main Sea's war machine and ultimate struggle against the Sijix. There's many endings, ranging from escaping, rendezvousing with the Sijix fleet, and even freeing the complex for the good of derelicts everywhere with my main man, Warlord. I've got to reiterate how incredible it is that everything encountered in-game is so neatly wrapped up in the context of the story. It's not like Adam where you're just fighting an endless stream of random monsters in caves all day. Everything exists for a reason. 
I know I said roguelikes don't evolve much in my other video, but I was talking about the generalities. Top-down, turn-based, tile-based, these are all pretty much locked in. But much like LRC V3, Cogmind has truly evolved. Alright, there's your zinger, I'm out of here.